Hello, hello, everyone. This is Adam Tabero with Psychedelic Vantage, and today I am honored to have Dr. Del Potter uh, as my special guest. Uh, Dr. Del Potter is a medical anthropologist, an entrepreneur, and the chief science officer slash founder at Spiritus Biosciences. Um, Dr. Potter earned his PhD in medical anthropology in 1980 through a joint program of UC Berkeley and UCSF Medical School. His doctoral research specialized in psychiatric anthropology, neuropharmacology, and ethnopsychopharmacology. He completed his psychotherapy clinical training at San Francisco Psychoanalytic Institute. Uh, welcome, Dr. Del Potter, and thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Very excited to have you here today. So uh, to just get right into things, um, I wanted to ask you about uh, your experience with the DMTX program with extended state DMT. I, uh, DMT is my favorite psychedelic, like full stop. Uh, and I have been so curious about the DMTX program for a long time now. And to find out that you did extended state DMT was just very exciting for me because now I get the chance to ask you about it so can you kind of give us uh an overview yeah I, yeah i'll just start with i've always had you know sort of a fascination with the shorter acting tryptamine tryptamine compounds that genre i think is very interesting uh because i i feel like there is a tremendous amount of therapeutic benefit packed into a very short time frame and 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 that is really of interest. Uh, I had the good fortune to have uh, about a year long mentorship working with Alexander Shulgin, who, when I was uh, a young, uh, a young kind of postgraduate, he understood that I was quite interested in this area and kind of introduced me to the novel chemistry around it. I had been approaching it from uh, doing anthropological research on ayahuasca. Uh, particularly among the Yanomami people in Brazil. And that's where I had my first experiences with it. Uh, what I felt was very profound with that first experience, I, it was a preparation that is sort of uh, in the folk vernacular referred to as Yopo. Uh, it's a combination of Anodanthera species uh, that contain both 5-methyoxy-DMT and DMT. And the way they administer it is using a, a bamboo bloat pipe, the same instrument that they use to hunt deer. I mean, to, that they use to hunt birds, actually. So one person will take a bolus preparation that's like ash and ground up seed and some other uh, botanicals, and they'll put it into these blow, this blow pipe and blow it up your nose. And that experience was so profound. But I think what really distinguishes it is how rapid the onset is. By the time that hit the back of my throat and nose, uh, I was higher than I ever could imagine being. Uh, and I was kind of catapulted into another world. And I think that's like one of the features that distinguishes both DMT and, and 5-methyoxy-DMT is the suddenness of the experience and how rapidly uh it it produces a produces an effect uh so when you know when i was able to have a, a more extended experience which i was able to have recently uh it really contrasted with that because even though the onset was still sudden and there was a peak it lasted so much longer that one begins to kind of be psychologically acclimatized to the experience, uh, which I don't think is the case with kind of a conventional DMT administration. You you have a chance to begin to explore the DMT world and uh, that and kind of get your bearings in it. And uh, uh, that extended state allows you to kind of adjust to uh, the environment that you're in. And I think that is is really profound. In that way, I, I would describe it as more like an LSD experience, except that it, it was overwhelmingly characteristic DMT with, uh, you know, really profound geometric patterns giving way to a, a, a real loss of ego or a loss of sense of self 
uh, that just eroded. The other the other aspect that I find really profound is the way it changes your uh, foreground and background perception. What you have always been focused on in the foreground recedes into the background, and what you have as kind of a peripheral perception moves into the foreground. And that can include like unconscious material from, you know, emotional material, uh, as well as perceptual material. But it seems like a general kind of effect. Did you did you feel that so through the extended so DMT in and of itself is very quick usually like 10 15 minutes and it's so intense that a lot of times you don't have the chance to really bring much to what's what's happening in the experience you just you go you you blast off and then you're experiencing stuff uh, so much stuff happening and it's overwhelming and then you kind of start coming back down to earth so because you were there longer you felt if I'm understanding you correctly, you felt that you were able to bring uh, more stuff to the table that like uh, subconscious things and like just maybe mm -hmm. just things that were deep down within your heart, maybe. Yeah, the the time frame usually is so rapid uh, before you can even blink your your back. You know, with conventional administration of DMT, this is much more of a plateau where you kind of enter a space. And then you remain in that space for some length of time. And then that way, I thought it was more like an LSD experience, but profoundly and characteristically a DMT experience. And like I said, it, it, it allows you, I think, a little bit to get your bearings in that space so that you feel more comfortable with it rather than just sort of gripping, you know, the seat and hanging on. Uh, you you get a chance to kind of relax into the space and explore it a bit more. And it was very much that typical DMT space that most people will get into when they kind of blast off and take like inhale DMT, right? Yeah, but I would again describe it as more of a plateau rather than you know a sharp up and a and a come down. It it kind of plateaus for some period of time, and it gives you a chance to really kind of explore psychological material that's why i think it's like a super valuable therapeutic tool were you kind of were you able to open your eyes and be aware during this experience or was it more so like diving inward uh it for me it was more like diving inward uh a lot of unconscious material came forward but uh at the same time there were you know the characteristic really engaging geometric patterns uh, the DMT seems to produce. So you're in this, like, uh, I, the only way I can describe it is, is, is it feels as if you've entered a, a different environment completely. Uh, with LSD, you kind of feel like, oh, I know that this is LSD and I know that it's altering my perception. Less so with the DMT extended state. It's more like you feel like you, you, you've entered a new environment. It really has that feeling. Wow. So has this evolved your perspective around DMT generally um, since doing extended state? Yeah, I think there's a, a, a real value in, in in the extended state experience. And by that, I mean, by when we talk about extended state, it's probably half an hour to 45 minutes. Oh, it's still incredibly than, short. It's still <laughs> incredibly short. But at the same time, uh, it, it's much longer than the 15 minutes or 20 minutes that you usually experience with DMT. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, length of time, I think, is extremely critical in being able to psychologically adjust to the experience. Do you think that this... So, I mean, we could... I think just speculating here, uh, it, it seems like this would also yield uh, more more therapeutic benefits, uh, essentially being under the influence of LSD for, or DMT for longer. It, it did for me because, as I said, you know, it brings a lot of material that's on the periphery or in your unconscious forward. And uh, in a short, shorter experience, you just get a glimpse of it. You see it and, and then you're already starting to return to earth. But in this case, with a more extended state, you, you have a chance to sort of catalog it and go through it in a, 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 a slower and sort of more precise fashion. And, uh, for me, it was incredibly beneficial.
So, so one of the my main complaints about DMT um, and is that it's very hard to bring memories back with you. It's like a lot of times you what you, you everything gets left there a lot of, large percentage of it. Were you able to bring more back with you because of the extended stay? That is really an excellent point about the difference uh, that you are able to bring a great deal more back because you actually have a moment to be able to kind of catalog it, look at it and process it. Whereas in the shorter, the, the very short experience, you don't have any time to do that. You, you, you know, you're just exposed to it and it's almost as if you're not recording it. Uh, you, you're just experiencing it. So this you know, balances the equation more to the recording side. Oh, well, that's really, really fascinating. So you see, there are a, a couple companies, most most of the companies, the biotech companies that are looking at DMT now are looking to extend the experience. Is that That's like the common thing I've noticed. Uh, we have Cybin with their deuterated uh, DMT injection. Um, a tie with VLS01. They're trying to, with the... The buccal, the transbuccal film that they want to have the basically DMT lasting about forty minutes. Uh, do you think that's the way to go if we're going to kind of introduce DMT therapeutically? Yeah, I, I've never been uh, a fan of vaporization. It's never appealed to me as a pharmaceutical way to administer uh, these compounds, and I'm I just have to say I'm not a fan of intravenous or intramuscular delivery. Yeah, I th think, you know, one of the things we've really come to understand is the importance of set and setting. And a lot of us have an anxiety about parental delivery, uh, whether it's subcutaneous, in intramuscular, or IV. I don't think anyone wants to start a DMT experience tethered to an IV. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, some people can handle it, but I don't think it's it, it, it makes the treatment as widely accessible. So other forms of administration, uh, I think, are more attractive. One of the uh, ways that we're exploring at Spiritist is uh, through transdermal and intradermal methods. In other words, put a patch on, uh, get to full blood levels very rapidly, uh, and you may, in fact, do more than one patch. You put on a series of patches uh, that kind of carry you through a longer-term experience. So with Spiritus, you're doing a, a DMT patch, correct? We're doing a, a intradermal DMT patches. Uh -huh. That's very interesting. And so how, how long will, will it take to get to peak blood plasma levels of the DMT? Really rapidly, five to seven minutes. And then how long would the entire experience itself be? You know, we think we can we can make the experience last up to 45 minutes. Oh, wow. And I'm assuming at some point, so how long would you be peaking for theoretically? You know, within that 45 minutes, I would say uh, a good half hour. Oh, wow. That's great. Um, that's very exciting. And so in a conversation I had with you previously, um, uh, we've, we've covered how in ayahuasca mixtures, uh, you have a little 5-MeO DMT and a little NNDMT. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, do you think that there, at some point within biotech, would be value in maybe combining some of these uh, psychedelics, maybe in small amounts? Yeah, the experiences are so qualitatively different. I think 5-methyoxy mm -hmm. DMT by itself is one of the most profound psychedelics. It's not characterized by the, the tremendous so much the tremendous alteration in perception where you have synesthesia where you know you see colors and you know you hear sound you, you know you hear colors that that blurring of of senses and more about loss of sense of self that really is what i think characterizes the five methyoxy dmt experience and um you know i i believe there's a tremendous amount of therapeutic benefit with that so i i kind of like the idea of being able to approach these experiences individually. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, there may be some interesting combination therapy as we get deeper into how, what the mechanisms of both are therapeutically. So let's, let's touch on this. So uh, I've, I think in the community in general, and it's also, I'm 
curious myself, there's always going to be, I don't think it's a fair comparison, obviously, because they're very different, but people will want to line up NNDMT compared to 5-MeO DMT. The experiences are very different for sure, but in terms of the therapeutic benefits that can be gained from either or. So what would you, kind? Of, so how would you stack them up against each other therapeutically? Well, like I said, I think, you know, 5-methyoxy-DMT is the most profound mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, you know, because that extreme loss of self, uh, which I think in many ways is kind of the point of the psychedelic experience. It really takes that particular aspect and, you know, multiplies it, you know, amplifies it. Uh, you know, DMT is more visual, uh, more uh, engaging that way. And some might say that that's a bit of a distraction, uh, no, that's, you know, that's how I feel uh, too. <laughs> and the, the, the five methyoxy DMT, that profound loss of self, I think that is, you know, sort of breathtaking. And I, I believe it is profoundly therapeutic. And I, I think it, it really has some of the most value. Um, I, I, many would agree with you and I agree with you as well. I think that, but if we're looking at it from, let's say like, we're trying to make these psychedelics more widely available, wouldn't 5-MeO-DMT is a very, uh, it's a, it's a, it's an intense experience. It's, it's like, it's a lot. So do you think that could be a, like a, a like the, a hump to get over a roadblock or a bottleneck for 5-MeO-DMT specifically? Cause like with NN. Uh, I feel at least it's it's much lighter, uh, even though it's a rocket ship and you're going um, because of the visuals, you are slightly more distracted and it can e it helps you ease into whatever it is you're feeling. Yeah, I, I, I completely do agree, you know, and I don't know if the five methyoxy DMT experiences for everyone uh, because it can be so jarring and and so uh, overwhelming Uh it, at least it has been that way for me. Uh, and, you know, suddenly to have your sense of self completely gone uh, is both a healthy experience, but it has a, a certain quality of danger to it, I think, uh, and can amplify, you know, you know, either bipolar issues or psychosis. And I, I think that, you know, dosage, again, is like, super important here mm -hmm. and i i'm not sure that one has to you know dive into the deep end of the pool immediately uh that it may be a better idea to approach it with a smaller dose at first just to uh become accustomed to what the experience is like but uh there is an incredible value to it notice uh with five of you the body load even with nn it was just tremendous like the body mm -hmm. load was tremendous and i in my experience when i did it it was that your body acclimates to it pretty quickly so once yeah. after you take that first hit you actually your blood pressure goes up you feel your heart racing but then your body starts to ease into it and then by the time i was ready to take the the second dose i felt much more calm and much more comfortable uh it was like right. a world of a difference and, and 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 that's what I mean. I th I think, you know, uh, it can be frightening and jarring if you take too much of a dose to begin with. And I think there's a, a certain value in, you know, starting slowly and building up. Because what's interesting about both DMT and 5-methyoxy-DMT, you don't have the refractory period that you have with like psilocybin or LSD where you have to go through a period of time for neurochemistry to kind of rebuild for you to get a really profound experience. Uh, you know, you can have repeated doses of both DMT and 5-methyoxy DMT, and, and each one is as profound as the one prior to it. Mm -hmm. 100%, I agree with you. Um, so now, it, we covered this briefly, but you mentioned that you're not a fan of uh injectable dmt right I, i'm just not a fan of parental delivery either either iv or intramuscular delivery in general I, and would it be just uh, because yeah. needles or is there more to that uh you know needles and um you know 
in terms of the the absolute suddenness uh, of the effect, uh, I am really, I like to examine that last mile to the patient in terms of formulation and delivery. Mm -hmm. And so at Spiritus, you know, we work on uh, sublingual sprays. We want, we want the experience to be as patient friendly and patient tolerable as, as it can be. So we work on sublingual sprays, uh, transdermal or intradermal patches, uh, you know, and one of the areas that we're starting to work in is nebulized formulations. So in other words, you inhale a cool mist. Uh, all of those seem more patient friendly and more patient tolerable. And I, I think the less anxiety that you have going into the experience, the better. I agree with that. A hundred percent. I agree with that. And I also think that, uh, we already have this Spravato right framework that's that's there, and I think something like this can plug into that more easily, right? It just it's because is it, Spravato is a nasal spray, so yeah, uh, you know I think it's you know twenty twenty four, and we can be concerned, more concerned about formulation and delivery, and it is possible to contour the experience extremely differently uh, just through formulation and delivery. A lot of people don't realize that it has the same level of exclusivity, for example, with the FDA, that novel chemistry does. So if mm -hmm. you come up with a very unique formulation and a very marry it to a delivery technology, that is as revolutionary as a brand new drug. Uh, so we can contour the experience differently. So, for example, our Solosin sublingual spray has a completely different pharmacokinetic profile than psilocybin powder in a capsule. For one thing, uh, we eliminate the uh, adverse GI effects that people experience. So, and and this is a, you know, even if you don't experience nausea or you don't experience a stomach upset, you still have an odd sense of body load uh, when you take psilocybin powder in a capsule or you eat mushrooms. Mm -hmm. With psilocin, delivered sublingually directly into the bloodstream, you don't have any of that. Uh, it's a much more, I would say, benign, patient-friendly uh, onset. Uh, and then we see different pharmacokinetics as well. We see a 10-minute onset instead of an unpredictable half hour or so, uh, you know, and you don't, I think that unpredictability kind of creates a certain level of anxiety like when's this going to happen? Uh, and what we see is a very predictable 10 minute onset and then more like a three hour du duration rather than the usual four to six hour duration uh, that psilocybin has. So mm -hmm. we believe that there is as much value in that shorter therapeutic window uh, as there would be for the longer experience. One of the big aspects of psychedelic treatment is trying to bring the cost down. And the biggest cost factor in the equation is the clinician's time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you have to sit with somebody for eight hours, uh, you really only can see one patient a day. But if you can cut that in half, then likely you can see two or maybe even three patients a day. Uh, and not only is it more cost effective, from that perspective, lowering cost, it also is, I think, more accessible. You know, it's not as much of a commitment uh, for people to engage with. And for that can make a big difference with marginal communities like the elderly or, you know, someone who just doesn't want to engage in a really protracted experience. It's, uh, it's, it's more accessible. Yeah, I agree with you. And that, that makes a lot of sense. And that's something that I've thought about before, too, uh, and how important that would be, because I feel like a lot of times when we're speculating on psychedelic biotech, generally, it's it's a lot of the people who are really passionate about it are usually psychonauts who are kind of, uh, they're a game for any of the experiences, the longer, the shorter, whatever. So I think it's important to to understand that there will be subsects of the population who would probably want uh, like a shorter experience that was not as just intense. Yeah, so we see that as a model 
for how we can take formulation uh, and delivery technology and completely contour the experience differently mm -hmm. and really take the rough edges off, uh, take the adverse effects and really deal with them just through uh, not uh, formulation and not having to you know, go to the capital intensive enterprise of trying to develop a brand new psychedelic. Mm -hmm. So this, this is actually just brings me to my next question. Um, so now we have Compass Pathways. Um, they're bringing their uh, psilocybin formulation, synthetic psilocybin formulation uh, to market. And I think it's going to be what, an eight hour experience? Is that is that I, what I they're aiming? Say, yeah. So mm -hmm. my from my perspective, uh, and like I want all these psychedelic companies to win. I'm not rooting against anyone for the most part. I just want psychedelics to be more accessible to the masses. Um, but I do find that that could be that's there could be a bottleneck there in terms of how many, like you're mentioning, how many patients you can treat, how much money that's going to cost. Um, it it's it seems like it's going to be tough from the get-go. I just don't see that going very smoothly, uh, especially with the duration of the experience. Um, you have any well, opinions on that? Two, two things. Uh, you know, I think it's really important for people to have options. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, not everybody, like you said, is going to want to have the extremely long experience. But by providing something that has a, an e easier barrier to entry, uh, you do make it more accessible. Uh, and at the same time, uh, people, there may be situations where, you know, a longer experience or more in-depth experience is called for. Uh, and there may be experience, you know, uh, situations where a shorter experience is the best choice. And, and we want to give, I think, clinicians uh, some options, you know. Here, you know, you, you can go for the longer experience if you think there's a, a lot of therapeutic value and you really want to accomplish something in that time frame, or you can go to, the, you know, use a tool uh, that allows you to work in a, in a shorter time frame. So it's all about, I think, providing clinicians with a toolkit mm. that is, you know, has options available. And, you know, let's take this out of the context of just simply medical uh and you know clinicians and you know using it for uh psychotherapy or psychedelic assisted psychotherapy or treatment of mental health issues you know i believe that we want to provide the community options as well uh and i'm a really great believer that the best context for a psychedelic experience may be uh, among family and friends. Uh, but again, it's about accomplishing different purposes. You know, it's great for mental health issues, but it's also great for getting closer to nature or just solving intimacy issues uh, in a couple or, you know, just trying to sort things out on a personal basis. Uh, so, you know, having those options, I think, is going forward is going to be super important, both in terms of accessibility and how we can integrate these experiences into the community. I agree with you. And uh, so what, this is a two-sided question here. So what are you most excited about for the future of psychedelic medicine? And what is your most controversial opinion in regards to, to psychedelic medicine? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I'll start with the controversial okay. uh, and and say that, you know, I, I'm not necessarily, and again, let me frame this a little bit differently and say, again, it's all about options, but I, I'm not sure about the value of the project to remove the psychedelic aspect of the experience I'm right there with you. from <laughs> psychedelics, you know, uh, I, generally think that that comes from people who have uh you know haven't experienced uh them as much firsthand and are thinking the, of this yeah let me just say quite simply that there are many aspects to the therapeutic benefits of psychedelics one is 
neuro increased neuroplasticity and include increased neurogenesis and and they kind of it kind of goes together but i think one of the most profound parts is the changes in the landscape of brain communication so whereas previously we have the default mode network directing traffic uh you know limiting our perception categorizing our perception and processing interceding between our sense of the world and the kind of interpretation that our brain is making of it. And I think there's a tremendous value in removing that uh, default mode network system and having increased communication between some of the older parts of the brain, you know, the, the amygdala and uh, allowing us to experience, again, options and choices, seeing things differently, taking a new meta perspective, and I don't think that can simply be explained by increased neuroplasticity, even though they do go together fairly well, because what we see is that after you've experienced that change in brain communication, it opens up a window that allows for change, you know, and you have that, that period of time after the experience where uh, you, you can get the most benefit out of it as you process and try to integrate what took place. But without that fundamental change in brain in brain communication, I just don't think there's as much value there. I, I really appreciate what you just said. And I guess the, my question would be is, so with psychedelic experiences, when you have these really, really profound psychedelic experiences, right? Ones where you come out of it and you're just like, I, I see, I'm seeing things differently. I feel new. I feel refreshed. Um, that is due to, I guess, right, the, these different thought processes that are being introduced to your head. But what what does neuroplasticity even feel like? Like, what is, can you even quantify if you had no well, psychedelic experience, what neuroplasticity feels like? Well, what, what you, you know, we all have that period after you have a psychedelic experience where you try to integrate and process what took place. Mm -hmm. And what we find is we've changed the landscape of brain communication and we've flattened it out. So communication can take place across, uh, you know, lines that were sort of segregated. Uh, and once you do that, the brain then attempts to integrate what took place into a new kind of level of interpretation. And I think that it it can never be the same. Once you've been exposed, I mean, there, there's mythological descriptions of this. There's, you know, cross-culturally, once you've had a good look at the supernatural, things aren't the same. Mm -hmm. And you realize that you have more control over your life than you thought you had. Mm -hmm. You realize that percept the relationship between perception, you know, the way you look at things, uh, and the way you do things uh, is is malleable, and that it isn't as categorically fixed as you thought. Uh, and that's that's where I think the opportunity for change is. So if you ask me, how do you experience neuroplasticity? It's in that period after a psychedelic experience where you feel like, you know, I can I can do things differently. And you know, uh, yeah, I was with. Andrew Weil during an experience uh, where he had uh, a psychedelic experience and was allergic to cats. And he he's written about this. And I, I just think it's such a great illustri illustration of how, the, how it works. He was allergic to cats. He was coming on to LSD. He had a cat jump on his lap. And he described at that point, well, I can choose to be allergic to this cat or I can choose not to mm -hmm. and he could feel himself and it's a very organic and holistic change I could feel he could feel himself deciding not to be allergic and so he was never allergic to cats subsequently after that I had a friend who during COVID lost his sense of taste and sense of smell you know as, as many people did Mm -hmm. And, you know, he had this little box of 
of tastes and smells that he would use to try and reactivate it. He, he was a doctor and um, the, he had his girlfriend convinced him to take psilocybin. And during the experience, he lives on a golf course. He suddenly smelled the grass being cut during that experience. And he went to his little box with all these different smells and he could smell all of them. Mm -hmm. So it had reorganized brain communication in such a way that it alleviated those symptoms. But what was most interesting is subsequent to that, after the experience, it stayed in place and he was able to smell and taste again. So you have this opportunity for change, this window for change, and it can be long lasting. That's really, really fascinating. And like, I, I've read stories similar to this before, and that's why why I very firmly believe like we're really only scratching the surface uh, in terms of what psychedelics can bring uh, to society at large generally. Um, but I guess the the question is, is like, and I, it, everything from my perspective is a lot of it, is, is there like a dose dependent um, aspect to yield certain specific uh, benefits, for example, like uh, to get his sense of smell back, was there a specific dose that like, it, let's say he would have done a really mild one gram, uh, whatever, psilocybin trip, would that have made a difference? Or is it about kind of getting into these more intense, mystical, like heavy experiences? We seem to see a correlation between an intense mystical experience, what people would characterize as an intense mystical experience and the profound change mm -hmm. uh, that, that it may be that that's necessary. You know, the, the jury's kind of still out on microdosing. We seem to see, you know, a little bit of change here and there, but for really profound change, I think, I think you need a solid therapeutic dose, which seems to have the most benefit, at least in terms of clinical research that's been conducted up to this point. Uh, I've tried microdosing before and I didn't on an actual microdose. I never, I was, it didn't really do much for me. So I, my microdoses are now just normal doses that that are just not like the, like, a, like a, an eighth or anything like that, maybe close to a gram. We haven't fully explored low dose though. Yeah. Low you know, dose. There, exactly. there may be, there may be a range that's past microdose, but not a macro dose mm -hmm. that's in a low dose range that may have considerable benefit. And I think, that may be particularly true of the shorter acting tryptamines uh, like 5-methyoxy DMT, like uh, a low dose of DMT or 5-methyoxy DMT, I think has a lot of therapeutic benefit. Say, say for example, you know, we've seen that it has uh, a benefit for chronic neurological pain, mm -hmm. uh, migraines, uh, cluster headaches, um, and, but a lot of, uh, you know, heavy dose, which would impair people is is kind of untenable. So there may be a sweet spot where we can find like a lower dose that actually causes the effect that we're trying to get without impairing you. That's really interesting. I never even considered that with 5-MeO or NNDMT. Can can you kind of give can you give that a little bit more color? Well, I just know uh people who are part of support groups that use DMT very effectively for treatment of cluster headaches, uh, chronic neurological pain, when nothing else seems to work. Nothing else uh, seems to have the same level of benefit. And I know that uh, it's also has a profound treatment effect for first responders who've been through extremely concussive traumatic events. Uh, it does seem to alleviate chronic neurological pain uh, chronic neurological disorder. You know, I'm, I'm not going to say that in all cases that's the case, but it's it's worth investigating. Could we find a low dose? And and I'll even go so far as to say uh, it may have some benefit for psychosis or schizophrenia in a lower dose format. Mm -hmm. uh, not as disorganizing, but still retain the therapeutic quality uh, that both 5-methyoxy DMT and DMT have in a lower dose. Is that something that I feel like in the medical world, that's that, that would be, that it would be, it would take a while before they would even consider looking at that for schizophrenia or anything like that, right? Uh, you know, there are people who want to make that jump. Uh, it 
will happen, I think, much more slowly because there's more risk involved. Uh, but, you know, for bipolar uh, and for, uh, you know, some uh, ex schizophrenic type experiences, I think there may be considerable therapeutic benefit from 5-methyoxy-DMT in kind of restoring, uh, having almost the opposite effect from what it does to people who don't have, that aren't afflicted with those indications. Uh, whereas it causes a loss of sense of self, it can also restore a sense of self. That's really interesting what you're saying. Uh, and and I'm, I'm actually fascinated by this. So now, are you referring to, when you're, what you just referenced, is that low dose or you're all across the board here, just 5-MeO-DMT generally? I, I, I'm really thinking at this point, low dose. Mm -hmm. And it may be something, you know, that we're attracted to in terms of uh, being able to deliver it with a, a transdermal patch. So okay. here you have a low dose and it's a sustained delivery over a period of time, but it's at a low dose. Uh, and the way we do that is is a kind of liposomal controlled release delivered intradermally. Uh, so you put this patch on and let's say treatment of cluster headaches, something like that. But then also it could be a way of, of treating schizophrenia as well. So is specifically with 5-MeO-DMT, it, is its aspect of kind of um, eviscerating the ego, uh, is that, that, that's where a lot of the ther therapeutic benefit is derived, where let's say these could be afflictions of the ego, uh, in a sense? Absolutely. That's, that's, I think, precisely, uh, how it can show tremendous benefit. You know, like I said, I, I don't know if the, it, it's appropriate for everyone, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it has a wide, uh, therapeutic benefit for a lot of people uh, I, and i think it, it it sort of distills out the core of the psychedelic experience uh in some ways you know that that is the most profound part of it is the, the loss of sense of self mm -hmm. and with that uh you know usually all the things that we use to you know organize our reality our sense of time uh segmented time you know, that there is a past, a present, and a future. When all of that is erased and all sense of self is erased, what do you have left? Uh, that it, there, there is some tremendous value in realizing or allowing that to happen. Uh, I think that's therapeutically beneficial. So when people describe 5-MeO-DMT as this reset of sorts, it sounds like that's kind of where what you're getting at as well here, is there there is this aspect of it resetting and kind of it, it, bringing yeah, it to the baseline. The resetting, I think, comes from this loss of self, the sense of self. That's where the resetting comes from, more so than any other psychedelic. Uh, you know, we have, like, let's take LSD, for example, over a 12-hour period, mm -hmm. you have a a gradual change in brain communication that increases up to four hours and then sort of have a, a downside where it, that effect decreases. With 5-methyoxy, boom, you open a door and your, your sense of self is gone. And, you know, that is both jarring and, uh, I don't know, kind of comforting in a way, oddly comforting. At least it has been for me. I mean, I, I think the the aspect of it kind of stripping away all these views and perspectives you've had your whole life on yourself that have been, that you've adopted through parents, experiences, this and that, and it strips that away completely. I could see that being extremely liberating. Yeah, it's not you. Mm -hmm. It's not you. You know, you, you are not simply the collection of everything that's kind of been put into you. You're mm -hmm. more than that. And and that that's the comforting part, I think. Yeah, that uh, that's sounds beautiful, actually. Um, and we had spoken off air about the implications for five MBO DMT and some research you're doing with uh, drug addiction. Yeah, no, uh, that was uh, previously uh, had worked on some some really interesting non clinical research mm -hmm. that I think this model, you know. Maybe may emerge as, as 
an interesting way way to approach examining CNS drugs. Uh, and that was at Alvarius Pharmaceuticals, where we worked on uh, human stem cells derived brain organoids mm -hmm. uh, and examining uh, the biomarkers having to do with learning and memory, uh, drug reward mechanisms, a whole range of mechanisms, kind of biomarkers around substance use disorder. So we were looking at, started out looking at cocaine use disorder and went on to look at opiate use disorder. And uh, what we would do is create these mini brains from human stem cells, provoke them into actually forming mini brains where they would begin to just begin to differentiate neural structures. And then we would expose them to cocaine for a two week period. And they would start, the biomarkers that we were measuring would all start to overexpress in a very, in very specific ways. Uh, and what we found was then we would intervene with a psychedelic drug to see what would happen to those biomarkers. And what was most interesting was 5-methyoxy-DMT restored the biomarkers almost completely back to normal. In other words, all the changes that it... So what happens is, you know, as you become addicted to a substance, uh, your body adjusts, your brain adjusts. It adjusts to that, that dopamine effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's difficult to disengage from it. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we found was the 5-methyoxy-DMT completely restored those biomat biomarkers uh, back to normal so that now you could just it was as if you were not addicted and you were starting over again at right. least in terms of what we were measuring that's really fascinating but my question is so these are these little mini brains that you created what, what's the best way to call them well it's, i don't sound <laughs> foolish <laughs> brain brain organoids All i right. guess brain organoids so I'm working under the assumption here that these brain organoids cannot have a psychedelic experience, right? Uh, you know, they aren't hooked up to eyes. They're not hooked up to a visual system or auditory system. Uh, they do react. They do, uh, they have, you know, some of the, sim they have biomarkers that reflect changes in, you know, learning and memory, reward mechanisms. And they react in some ways like a brain would. And what's really interesting about them is they're epigenetic. That is, they reflect, they come from a person. Mm -hmm. So they reflect a very specific genetic profile. That's really interesting. Uh, and so, you know, we were always thinking that there may be a point in the future where we, we biobank our own brain organoids, expose those brain organoids to a psychedelic drug, and be able to determine in many ways what, what the therapeutic arc and value would be. So we, we would be able to say, you know, this is the right combination of psychedelic drugs for you based upon an algorithm that analyzes the way it works with these mini brains. Wow. So was 5-methoxy-DMT the only psychedelic you guys were testing on these organoids or were there other We also looked at psilocybin and LSD. Mm -hmm. uh, and L psilocybin came close, but the 5-methyoxy-DMT was, was the most profound, produced so then, the biggest change. So LSD, what, not as much. So what is it about 5-methoxy-DMT? Because once again, these organoids are not having an ego death experience or any anything like that. So what is it inherently about 5-methoxy-DMT that can actually kind of restructure how you're you're dealing with like addiction? I think it's the activity at the 5-HT1A receptor, uh -huh. which is unique to 5-methyoxy-DMT. Uh, that has a cascade effect that's considerably different uh, than, you know, agonism simply at the 5-HT2A the receptor. Is So is does Ibogaine also activate 5-HT1A? Uh, uh, you know, not to my knowledge. To my 
to, to my understanding, uh, DMT and 5-methyoxy DMT, 5-methyoxy DMT in particular, uh, has a lot of agonism at 1A. Got you. Um, so uh, we're going to, I'm backtracking a little bit here, but so I, you, I've spoken at length with you about ayahuasca and your experiences with ayahuasca in general. So now how would extended state DMT kind of stack up with ayahuasca experiences? Is there a similarity there at all? You know, there, there is a similarity, uh, uh, you know, a lot, I would say, uh, but you know, the, the ayahuasca experience is much longer mm -hmm. you know it's usually three hours plus uh depending on how much you take uh and i think it's it's perhaps gentler uh and and again less sudden uh it's it's more of a a, a kind of a gentle handshake whereas the extended state dmt is like a door is burst open and you burst through into another room. Does experientially the, does the extended state DMT also? Were you getting a, a lot of psychedelic euphoria with it? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, but you have the visuals that you get with DMT a great deal. Uh, you have those begin to recede after a certain period of time and you have more of a psychological space that's the way i would describe it a psychological space so yeah introspective you mean or yeah yeah more introspective more uh uh able to kind of look at yourself uh it kind of holds up a mirror in some ways mm -hmm. uh but um not so much like the very forceful way that Ibogaine would, mm -hmm. uh, and and less cinematic than Ibogaine, uh, but more allowing you some time to go through your material on your own. Oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, and and you know, on point of fact, as I understand it, you know, Ibogaine does have some effect on five HT one A not as much as DMT and 5-methyoxy DMT, however. Mm -hmm. So uh, with all the, uh, a common theme with DMT ayahuasca um, is experiencing entities and whatnot and people having very similar experiences without actually uh, being imprinted by someone else's experience. Like uh, a very common one is the blue woman or this this female entity, right? uh this healing female entity we also have the the machine elves i've never experienced machine elves ever um but we we have stuff like that where it's common what can you attribute that to um when we're talking about dmt in general you know my take on that is that there is a universality to the way dmt affects one in terms of how it affects brain structures i don't believe I don't want to give too much ontological status to going through a portal and encountering entities, but ayahuasca, DMT, all seem to provoke a certain kind of symbology and imagery. And, you know, I, I, we were talking how that was first noticed by the anthropologist Claudio Naranjo, where he gave ayahuasca to people in a, in a jungle setting and then in an urban setting. And they had the same kinds of animal imagery, jaguars, uh, snakes, uh, you know, a, a lot of people see this kind of animal imagery. And then other people hear the chatter and see machine elves. There's something about the universality of the experience that may have something to do, again, with how pronounced the agonism it has at 5-HT1A uh, that makes those experiences unique compared to other psychedelics you think you you mentioned 5-HT1A a couple of times at this point mm -hmm. is this and for some reason we're not in the academic side or the biotech side of this I we're not often frequently hearing about 5-HT1A um is it that maybe the field needs to catch up to that or are people doing it and just not talking about it uh, you know there's a lot of research on it 
Uh, it has a tremendous effect on depression. Uh, in in depression, the combination of, uh, you know, the G, uh, I think it's the 1019 allele and stress uh, for, create reductions in postsynaptic 5-HT1 receptors. Uh, so there is a relationship between depression and 5-HT1A. Uh, there, it also has a lot of effect on learning and memory. Mm -hmm. uh, it influences the activity of glutaminergic uh, uh, and GABA energic neurons in the cerebral cortex and in the hippocampus. So uh, it has, I think, been relatively less explored, but I, I believe that there is a lot of exploration going on with it now. Oh, that's interesting. And also you mentioned that it was specifically with addiction as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Particularly with drug learning and memory. Uh, you know, there is, and, and you know, there's a lot of relationship between depression, uh, substance use disorder, PTSD, uh, all of these seem to kind of have a common etiology in many ways. People with PTSD tend to have substance use disorder. People with substance use disorder tend to have PTSD and they tend to be depressed. Mm -hmm. So whether, whether we're actually looking at sort of a different expression of the same thing, I think that's kind of where the commonality ex exists on, on what, you know, 1A, uh, what role 1A plays. Understood. Um, in conversations that me and you had off the air, you had mentioned that you were working on these pre and post um, uh, peptide uh, formulations for uh, basically helping with the psychedelic experience in general. Yeah, again, um, I'm kind of looking at that last mile to the patient and mm -hmm. seeing how we can use that formulation and delivery experience to make the experience as beneficial as possible. And we've seen a tremendous amount of benefit from oh, the whole range of bioactive peptides that are emerging. Uh, if you're unfamiliar, there are literally thousands of them. Uh, uh, and the ones that we have been working with have the ability to optimize immune system health, optimize mitochondrial health, uh, increase clarity, cognitive clarity, uh, reduce anxiety. And so what we're trying to work on is developing sort of a protocol for using certain bioactive peptides pre-experience and then also using certain bioactive peptides post-experience that are restorative and integrated can you can you speak on some of these peptides or is that uh classified information uh you know I, i'll just say that for example uh you know one that we're looking at in terms of immune health is ss31 mm -hmm. uh we're also looking at uh the general ability of bpc 157 and tb500 used together for a, a restorative post experience, uh, you know, sort of creating a, a, a better equilibrium post experience. Uh, and C-Lank and C-Max, uh, some brain peptides that, again, increase cognitive clarity uh, and tend to uh, reduce anxiety and not in the way I would say that, uh, you know, Xanax works as an anxiolytic where you know you're just kind of dull mm -hmm. this is very subtle in other words something things that have been bothering you just don't have the same weight that they had previously so we believe that as a preparation for the psychedelic experience this tends to reduce anxiety and put you in a state where you're most receptive to the change that psychedelics can provide that's really interesting. And I think it takes like the, the preparation 
to the next level where it, it, it's much more involved. Uh, I've heard of C-Link and C-Max before, and I was actually interested in trying them, but I never got a chance to. Um, but so it, you're saying it's a very subtle a anxiolytic effect? Yeah. Um, like I said, it's it's almost difficult to describe because, you know, we're used to an anxiolytic being something like Xanax, where, you know, you just calm down like, uh, and it's it's almost like you're a bit impaired. In this case, you're just not as disturbed by the things that are bothering you. It's very subtle. So, uh, you know, we're also looking at how can we use peptides to increase the neuroplasticity effect? How can really we use peptides to increase the uh, neurogenesis effect as well? Uh, so, you know, peptides... Uh, maybe a way to put you in the best space possible to be receptive for the change that psychedelic can produce. Is there, so I know with BPC and TB, those are usually injecting those, right? Uh, are right. you guys looking at formulating them to be um, maybe a transdermal patch or an inhaled? Yeah, that we actually are currently in Spiritus is in a joint venture with bio reset medical mm -hmm. uh, a clinical practice uh done by dr matt matt cook and what we uh have been doing is creating uh, alternative delivery strategies and formulations for bioactive peptides one of the biggest impediments to more wide-scale adoption is the fact that you you buy this powder you mix it with bacteriostatic water you hope you mix it right then you pull, draw it up into a needle, and then you inject yourself. And if you really want to take advantage of several different peptides, you're injecting yourself maybe five, six, seven different injections mm -hmm. uh, and hoping that you've measured everything properly. Mm -hmm. So uh, our approach is uh, a patch that's the size of a quarter and a actual drug topical area that's the size of a dime. Mm -hmm. You put this on, and in five to seven minutes, you have uh, full blood levels as if you injected. Wow, that's really interesting. Uh, and these are um, what we call micro needle patches. Uh, they d are designed sort of to miss nerve endings, so it's not as if you actually feel anything when you put them on. And they're they're teeny tiny little needles, uh, and they're coated with the drug substance, so that when you put it on. Uh, they're able to get through the first layer of the dermal, first dermal layer and get into the bloodstream really rapidly. Mm -hmm. So through a combination of sublinguals and intradermal patches, we can like avoid, uh, you know, the massive number of injections you have to be able to take advantage of uh, the benefits of, of uh, bioactive peptides. The other thing is once you mix them up, uh, then they usually have to be kept refrigerated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want to travel, that means you've got a cold pack and you're going through the airport with, you know, a styrofoam little chest with a bunch of needles and, you know, cold pack and everything. These have shelf life. So, you know, you can, you can just store them on the shelf and get a month's worth and take them with you wherever you are. So that also increases kind of the patient engagement, patient compliance, so that you can actually take advantage of them. So what are you guys seeing with, with BPC-157 specifically? Because uh, I feel like that's probably the most popular peptide that we hear about these days. A lot of people are using it for uh, just uh, like injuries and stomach problems or like to help with that or also even downlight, down regulating dopamine receptors. Uh, it, it does amazing things with muscle recovery mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we'll be able to, one thing we're excited about is uh, being able to look at local effects with a patch as opposed to a subcutaneous delivery. So there is some evidence that uh, there is like a local effect. So like, let's say you injured your knee. If you put the injection directly into your knee, you seem to get an increased benefit locally. I actually uh, did that for a while. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it seems to work. And the other thing is that by putting a patch on your knee, you'll get a similar effect. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's got a benefit for muscle recovery, uh, for um, 
GI disorders mm -hmm. generally, uh, and it, it really has uh, a kind of regulatory function that uh, decreases, uh, you know, inflammation in general. So it's one of the ones we rely on as part of the protocol for uh, psychedelics as well. That's interesting. I guess uh, it wouldn't have any interaction with psychedelics, right? That that you're seeing? No, we see it as operating kind of, you know, peripherals to psychedelics. So you know, you get yourself in exactly the best frame of physical, uh, the best physical shape that you could be in. Then your psychedelic experience is going to be the most beneficial, have the most mm -hmm. beneficial effects that it can have. That's really interesting. And then also, how would how would does TB five hundred fit into the equation? It it seems to work kind of synergistically with uh, BPC one five seven, but it, it has you know it seems to increase the benefits of it. Uh, it also has a benefit for wound healing. Mm -hmm. uh, it also seems to increase you know like collagen deposition. Uh, you know, it increases the production of fibroblasts when, uh, you know, you, you can deliver it directly to a wounded area. So they do seem to work kind of, uh, in conjunction with one another. Understood. So, all right, going, reversing a little bit more here, uh, just because we're, we're just covering a lot today. Um, so when you did the DMT at, with the extended state DMT, that was with IV, correct? Correct. Have you got gotten the opportunity to try uh, any DMT for formulation that was a subcutaneous injection yet? Uh, no. Uh, you know, I was trying, again, to do the uh, extended state mm -hmm. and... That was best accomplished through, you know, a, a slow kind of IV delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, I, I'm uh, less attracted to being tethered to that IV. Mm -hmm. So we're really working on how can we use a transdermal kind of topical delivery uh, that has a controlled liposomal delivery uh, to create a sustained effect. I understand. Now how would uh an inch so how would an intramuscular injection of dmt compare to an iv dmt experience because well you're gonna you're gonna have different pharmacokinetics you mm -hmm. know uh the iv is going to be slightly more gradual but longer lasting mm -hmm. uh whereas the subcutaneous is going to be more or intramuscular is going to be more resembling what you get from DMT vaporization. Oh, very sudden, very sudden onset. Not the extended state. Uh, you know, more rapid peaking. Uh, yeah, and I, I got to say the the thing that you know really turns me off to vaporization is how unpredictable the dose is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like you can get a massive dose through vaporization, or you can get a little dose and not having the ability to control that or direct that, uh, you know, vaporization is kind of all over the place. Are you familiar with, you're familiar with Jay's research, right? Yeah. So they're, they, they apparently are, they tried to create a nebulizer type thing for 5-MeO DMT administration now. Um, and they have this whole protocol. It's similar to what, they're doing ceremonially where you're increasing the dose, like the handshake dose, and then you're going up from there. Um, is do you have any perspective around that? I'd love to hear what you have to what you think. We're we're hugely interested in nebulized delivery of mm -hmm. drugs in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh the opportunity to use the vascular surface of the throat and lungs as as kind of a vehicle, but being able to deliver it at uh, a very small particle size is the challenge. So you want to get to a like one to three micron particle size uh, and not leave any residue on the lungs. You only use, you know, sort of FDA approved ingredients for nebulizers that will work as permeation enhancers to kind of drive it through the 
uh, mucosal tissue uh, and, you know, basically leave no residue whatsoever. I think that nebulized delivery may be the way we can deliver a lot of these drugs that, uh, you know, most of them are water soluble. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of marrying a perfect formulation to a device that's able to break down the particle size of the water of the liquid medium down to a really fine mist uh, without heating it. So usually that's accomplished through what we call an acoustic wave technology and a mesh technology. So you basically vibrate at a high frequency and then you have a mesh that limits the size of the particles that go through it. Uh, and you do this without shearing the molecules. In other words, breaking the molecules in half or, you know, breaking them apart. So you want, you know, there, there's a few challenges in being able to do it perfectly, but we see nebulized drug delivery is maybe the state of the art and maybe the way we could deliver a lot of these drugs in the future. Uh, you're definitely I, you winning know, we, me over. We first, <laughs> yeah, we first see a device that, you know, has got Bluetooth connectivity hooked to the internet mm -hmm. uh, and it records your use. Uh, it can have some relationship to a medical database where we have your genetic history, we have your medical history, we maybe have some blood work, uh, and we are able to prescribe doses directly to the, to the device uh, and be able to give you exactly what you need based upon your medical history. Would you be also, would you also be able to, through a nebulized delivery of a psychedelic, let's say 5-MeO-DMT, for example, um, to extend the, the, the DMT experience? A couple of different ways, you know, you can take repeated inhalations, but there's also a way of providing, uh, uh, liposomal, uh, encasing the molecules in liposomes in a liposomal coating, which allows some of the molecules to be into your system immediately. And then others to be metabolized more slowly. Mm. So, you know, you can, you can do controlled release that way. And that's one of the ways, one of the things we're working on. Oh, wow. That, that's really, really interesting. Uh, I did not realize that uh, these through a nebulizer, you had so many different possibilities. Uh, it's yeah. pretty, really fascinating, actually. Yeah. Just imagine, you know, a medication pod, you know, the, the medication pods we're working on have a, like a little RFID chip in them. So you can't open it up and put whatever in there. It comes sealed and it has, you know, a perfect formulation in it. Uh, it goes into the device. You can only use that proprietary pod and we ship you whatever in that proprietary pod. Uh, then on the other side, the device has a fingerprint biometric technology. So no unauthorized use, nobody could just pick it up and use it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's keyed specifically precision medicine, uh, to exactly how it should be dosed for you. That's I I'm very, I can't wait, cannot wait for something like this to actually be available. <laughs> um, uh, something I forgot to ask you earlier. So what, in my experience, uh, you, trying different pro drugs of uh, psilocybin and also psilocin, and how was how does a psilocin experience differ from, let's say, a psilocybin experience? Is there any difference there? Yeah, it's a lot different. Uh, it um, it's much more. It, it it seems to me less body load, mm -hmm. uh, less. Uh, it, it has an overall feeling of less toxicity. Mm -hmm. uh you know part of the experience with psilocybin has to do with the conversion mm -hmm. of psilocybin yeah. into psilocin right and while psilocybin is in your body it's interacting with it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier mm -hmm. but it does interact with serotonin receptors in your gi tract mm -hmm. which contributes to this sense of body load and nausea mm -hmm. so when you go to psilocin and it's delivered directly into the bloodstream it's it's a, a, I would describe it as uh, less toxicity, uh, cleaner, uh, 
more cerebral in that sense. Uh, and, you know, just overall, all the aspects of psilocybin that you dislike and what you do like amplified. So does it also, uh, can that shape the psychedelic experience you're having as well? I think it does. Uh, you enter the experience with, you know, even a slight a bit of nausea or a slight bit of body load kind of, you know, it's something that you kind of have to overcome mm -hmm. in the experience. Uh, you don't have any of that. You have a, a, a real rapid, predictable onset. Uh, it's almost more LSD-like in that sense. Uh, cleaner, less body load, uh, just in general, uh, a better experience. Understood. Um, and I get, this is going to be uh, one of the last few questions I want to leave you with, but this is just something uh, I've been generally interested in. And I think we, we spoke about it briefly, but off the record. Uh, how is... So, Salvia. <laughs> uh, the psychedelic that is every almost everyone who's experienced psychedelics has probably tried it at one point or another had very interesting to scary um experiences with psychedelics are there any therapeutic benefits to salvia that may be being overlooked and how could we make that um more accessible to people who might benefit from these therapeutic experiences because isn't it more of a dissociative than a traditional psychedelic yeah i mean i, I would put it more in the category of ketamine uh, -huh. uh and but we've seen that ketamine has both uh benefits for neuroplasticity therapeutic benefits for depression uh you know even substance use disorder alcohol use disorder uh and so i think that there is uh a therapeutic benefit for salvia i think we have to kind of work on crafting it a bit differently to take some of the rough edges off uh, it, for me, was one of the most frightening experiences I've ever had. Likewise. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, it's over quite quickly. Uh, but it, it, I think, has, uh, some different things to teach us. Uh, the Mazatec recognize a relationship between salvia and mushrooms. And they reference mushrooms as the little children and salvia as the shepherdess. Mm -hmm. So salvia has almost an overarching benefit in relation to the mushrooms uh, and can actually help to frame the mushroom experience the way they look at it. Uh, oh, for me, I, I, I had a lot of difficulty with it in a traditional setting, uh, but I know that there's a lot of uh, research going on to look at how it can be improved uh you know how it can be and how analogs of it can either have a longer lasting effect at a lower dosage uh and basically make it more ketamine like mm. and a ketamine like but also just easier on the body as opposed to how it, exactly i got that exactly uh, is, is there something about, uh, so what is it? Salvia has a, it, it binds like the kappa opioid receptor. Is that... Yeah, it's a kappa opioid receptor agonist. So in in that, in the mechanism of action there is like, that's unique to any other psychedelic out there. Is there some advantages to actually binding at that receptor? Um, I, I think there is, you know, uh, it, you know, it's so unusual as a dissociative mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I believe it has a, a, a slightly similar pathway to ketamine. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we see a lot of benefit from these kinds of dissociative uh, drugs. They're they're easier to manage in some ways mm -hmm. than, than psychedelics uh, and may be more appropriate for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, if we can take the rough edges off of, off of salvia, you know, I think it'll be a lot more useful. I got you, and I agree. Uh, all right, so this is the last, the last thing I wanna, I wanna leave the the audience with. So there's a, this a tremendous amount of discussion around kind of how we the biotech side of things uh, might be taking the spirit out of these psychedelics, right? Um, we are just kind of 
we're creating synthetic formulations uh and we are kind of taking well like the the, the overarching sentiment is uh we're taking some of the traditional spirit out of these psychedelics and you as a man who's uh, I think has a foot in both sides here. You appreciate the tradition and the ceremonial aspect of these psychedelics and the spirit of the psychedelics, but at the same time, you're also on the science side and you're uh, deeply ingrained in that. So what is your perspective around this? Yeah, um, I'm, I do have kind of a, a foot in both worlds. Uh, I think biotech's role is that in the development of psychedelics is that it brings numerous benefits, including, you know, safety, efficacy, accessibility. Uh, the scientific approach, uh, however, can sometimes overlook or minimize the spiritual or cultural dimensions of psychedelics that has been so central to their traditional use. Mm -hmm. And I think the challenge really lies in finding a balance that respects and integrates both of these diverse aspects. So, uh, you know, a lot of times people will will say that there is really no benefit to, uh, you know, a biotech approach, let's say. Uh, and I, I would really say that, you know, uh, I would really question that. In the shaman that I've worked with in indigenous communities, they were very interested in LSD and synthetic psychedelics. And they saw the ease of use as an advantage. Uh, they saw the potency as an advantage. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, we 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 are interested in using psychedelics to treat various mental health conditions. But they have a much greater role to play, I think, in society that's recognized by uh, indigenous communities. And that is, uh, they have a way of building both community uh, spirit and recognizing, you know, a, a cohesiveness in the community uh, and, you know, getting you closer to nature, getting you, you know, closer to one another. Uh, so I, I think all of that is super valuable. I think the best thing is to try and find a mi middle ground where we take advantage of both things. You know, I'm, I'm always telling people that it's very difficult for Westerners to fully appreciate an indigenous worldview, uh, that it, it it's a lot different if you've been raised in a culture, you speak a language, you've, you know, spent your entire childhood and period of development learning uh, how to appreciate the place of psychedelics. And, uh, you know, we don't, we don't, have that uh and it's very difficult to acquire uh i'm often i often tell people you know westerners you'll you'll never actually become a shaman it's very mm -hmm. unlikely uh but on the other hand what does western science bring it brings a lot you know we would prefer to take our aspirin in pill form and not have to take it off the bar bark of a tree so, again, I think that there may be kind of a middle ground that takes advantage of, of both without uh, compromising either. Oh, I appreciate that. And I agree. I, I, I don't know what form that middle ground will take shape, but I guess it, it, will, it remains to be seen as, the, as all this evolves, right? Yes. Uh, I, I'm not sure either. You know, I mean, I, I think it really starts with uh, respect for indigenous knowledge. Uh, you know, there's kind of an ongoing debate about the ethical implications of extracting and commercializing traditional knowledge without proper acknowledgement or, you know, benefit sharing with indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one issue that really needs to be dealt with. Uh, and, you know, concerns about cultural appropriation and uh, the loss of traditional practices as uh, psychedelics become more commercialized. All of that, I think, are really significant. Uh, and we need to recognize what uh, indigenous, the indigenous pro approach provides, and that is uh, a more holistic approach. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, therapeutic models that 
integrate spiritual elements, recognize the importance of mindset, the environment. Uh, you know, maybe the best environment is not in a hospital setting. Mm. Uh, you know, but maybe we can we can see a hybrid model where emerging practices blend kind of scientific rigor with spiritual or traditional elements and honor both the cultural roots of psychedelic and modern therapeutic needs. Oh man, I really hope that that's kind of where things start to head at some point. I guess, like I said, it's really up in the air at this point, but uh, I really appreciate your perspective on this. And thank you so much for, for taking part in this conversation. It's great. It's been great talking to you. Um, if you guys like this episode, please drop a like and subscribe. I will leave a link to uh, Dell's uh, uh, biotech company, uh, Spiritus Bioscience, uh, and any relevant uh, things that we covered, I'll have linked in the description. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed being a part of this. Thank you so much, Dell, for being a part of it. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Been a pleasure. Great talking to you.